Welcome everyone to the Pulse Seminar. It's my great pleasure to, uh, to uh, introduce Alessandra Gorla. She's a professor at MDA Software in Madrid. Uh, she's well known for her work in Android security, which she's going to be talking about today, uh, and other types of, uh, of app analysis. But she also works in many other varieties of software engineering. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Uh, so thank you for, for hosting me, uh, first of all. So this is a joint uh, work with, uh, with a bunch of people uh, in Saarland University. Uh, mainly I want to mention uh, Konstantin and Vitaly, uh, two uh, PhD students um, who are uh, working in Andreas Zeller's group. So I definitely have to, to uh, thank them for, uh, for doing this uh, work together with me. So uh, as uh, Michael mentioned, I'm also working in other, in other um, topics. That's why I thought that before actually uh, start telling you uh, about uh, this um, uh, this work on uh, Android um, analysis. I want to give you a brief overview of uh, other things that I've been doing. So let me start from the very beginning. Uh, I'm I'm uh, Italian, so I uh, studied there, and my research career, uh, let's say, as a bachelor and master student, uh, studied in the work of um, in the area of software testing. And uh, what I've been doing back then was um, to develop uh, a data flow uh, testing technique that uh, mainly aimed to identify um, interesting integration points. So given two Java components, uh, what we um, aimed to do was to identify what were the in interesting integration points that a test uh, suite should be covering. And um, so we, we developed um, uh, some uh, static analysis um, technique to, to identify these points and also uh, uh, some, some instrumentation um, code to, to actually monitor that uh, a test suite was actually uh, covering these integration uh, points. Uh, what we did uh, after that was also to, uh, to include uh, this, um, this component into um, some uh, test input generator tool. Um, we used Able Suite. Uh, if you're not familiar with that, maybe we can discuss uh, more about uh, a bit uh, about it later. Uh, but uh, so the, in essence, what it does is can um, automatically generate test inputs that um, satisfy specific um, coverage criterion. And uh, so we used our previous work to simply uh, use uh, data flow um, information as a new uh, criteria that EvoSuite had to generate uh, test inputs for. So in a way, what we could uh, get was um, given uh, a Java class that you want to test, uh, you give it uh, to, to EvoSuite, and EvoSuite is able to generate uh, some, um, test, uh, some uh, test suite that can achieve a high um, coverage in terms of uh, data flow. Um, so after this, I moved um, to, to Switzerland for my PhD uh, in the uh, University of Lugano. Um, and there I changed a bit uh, the, the, the topic of my research. And I, I've been working on uh, automatic fixing um, techniques. So um, what I basically learned uh, working on software testing is that uh, no matter how hard you try to catch all the bugs, uh, you still leave some bugs in the code. So once you deploy the software, then there is nothing uh, that you can really do um, about them. So uh, what, I, what I was thinking then back then is it, it is interesting to try to think of some techniques that can try to um, avoid the bad effects of having bugs in the deployed software. And um, so then um, I've been working on, on this technique that we call automatic workarounds, where basically the idea is if at runtime you have uh, some, some, fail some failure in the execution, uh, what we do is um, we catch the, the runtime exception, we roll back uh, the system to a previously saved uh, checkpoint, and we try to execute something that should be semantically uh, equivalent to what you want it to do, uh, but hoping that what you try to execute as an alternative doesn't lead to uh, a failure once again. Um, <clears throat> so 
This, uh, this idea, as, as you can see, that, that's how, why we, we call it workaround, because we do not really try to fix the problem that is in the code. We just try to avoid it. Um, also led to another idea that went back to the testing. So if you know that two uh, operations are supposed to be equivalent, so take, for instance, m and m prime, then you can also use this information for testing. So um, if you have, um, in, in your test suite, if you have a set of uh, method executions uh, and you have, at some point, an invocation to, uh, to method m, then what you can do is you can directly check that the, ex the, the effect of executing m is equivalent to executing m prime. So somehow with this information, we can have some, uh, some automatic checks that in case of failure, uh, immediately report uh, you uh, an issue. Um, <clears throat> so after my, my, my time in Lugano as a PhD student, I moved to, to Germany, uh, to Saarland University. And uh, there I changed, uh, again, the, the direction of my, uh, my research. And that's where I started uh, working uh, on trustworthy uh, software. And uh, back then, the, the, the big thing, the, the big new topic was working on a mobile application, and especially uh, Android. So um, and this is uh, the main uh, topic that I want to, uh, to discuss about today. So let's, uh, let's get into this. So when I, when I started working on that, um, I remember that there were lots of uh, news, lots of announcements around that were talking about um, some applications that were very popular. So, uh, so back then it was uh, Angry Birds or Flappy Bird uh, was another one um, that had a lot of clones. Uh, so it had a lot of similar applications that pretended to be the real thing, but then they were actually doing another thing um, underlying. So <clears throat> somehow what I was, what I got really interested in in, uh, in this field was, okay, the application is claiming to do something. So the application claims to be uh, Angry Birds. So it claims to be a nice uh, and popular game, but actually does something that is malicious. So why don't we try to understand uh, this mismatch between what the application claims to do and what it actually uh, does. So just to give you uh, an example that uh, didn't really make it to the news like the, the previous uh, ones, um, let me present you this, uh, this application that is called uh, London Restaurants that is uh, a real application that used to be on the, on the Google Play Store. And if you read the description uh, that used to be on the, on the Google Play, then you see that this application looks like something that you want to have on your uh, mobile phone if you go to a, to a city like London, because it can guide you to uh, nice restaurants and nice places that uh, you might want to visit. However, what this application uh, was doing underlying was also to, uh, to collect uh, some sensitive information um, of the user. So for instance, it was, um, getting information on the uh, on accounts. It was uh, reading and sending out the uh, mobile number of the user or the device ID. So this is kind of un definitely an unexpected behavior. And you might even think that this is something malicious. So some something that this type of application should not be doing, right? So at this point, I. I started wondering, OK, so what is a definition of malicious behavior? So does it mean that uh, every application that sends out uh, the account information or collects the mobile uh, number or the device ID is malicious? Well, unfortunately, it's not that easy. Because if you think about other applications, for instance, uh, WhatsApp, then it does exactly the same things. But nobody would consider this behavior in WhatsApp as, some, as something malicious. So in essence, uh, what, what is the, the, the key um, point here is that it really depends on what type of application uh, we are looking. So then we started 
thinking from, from another uh, point of view and said, okay, maybe it's easier to think about what is normal behavior uh, instead of what is uh, the malicious uh, behavior. So if we take the, the London restaurants app, then um, we know that this application is a travel application. So for this type of application, it's common, for instance, to access the, the user uh, location, but it, it's not so common to, uh, to collect um, uh, sensitive information, uh, for instance, the accounts. Um, while, for instance, collecting uh, the um, account information and maybe sending uh, text messages is something that is <coughs> common for a messaging app. So in essence, we're really, the key is to understand what type of application uh, we were talking about and see what it does. So <clears throat> we started uh, then this, this work on um, analyzing the, uh, the description of the application and see uh, whether uh, it was matching um, its, uh, its real implementation in the code. And we developed this technique that is called uh, Chabada that works as uh, follows. So we, uh, we start by collecting a large set of um, uh, applications from the Google Play. And then we uh, analyze the um, natural language um, description that appears on the Google Play um, describing the, the applications. And we identify different topics out of uh, this body of descriptions. We then um, cluster together applications that have similar descriptions. And once we have that, within each cluster, we look at how applications behave. And we do this by looking at what are the, the key uh, API calls uh, that the, the application is doing to the Android framework. And at this point, what we do is simply look for <laughs> anomalies and report them. So let me tell you a bit more about, about uh, each single step. So as I said, we started uh, by, collect, by crawling the, the Google Play, and we uh, downloaded within uh, a time frame of a few uh, months roughly uh, 40,000 uh, applications, actually 32,000. And um, so together with the APK, we also downloaded the, the metadata, so the, the description and, and uh, other similar informations. So what we did as a first step was for each application, we took the, uh, the description, the natural language description, and we gave it uh, as an input to, uh, uh, to LDA to build a topic, a topic model. So what LDA gives us is uh, a set of topics that uh, can be inferred by the, the corpus of, of documents. And uh, so each topic is, in essence, a set of words that frequently occur together in the corpus uh, that, uh, that it has observed. So for instance, uh, what we could find were topics such as uh, map, navigation, street, and tour. That is something that reminds you of, uh, I don't know, navigation. Uh, or another topic could be uh, weight, body, exercise, run. So something uh, about the health. Another thing that uh, LDA gives you is for each um, application and its corresponding um, description, it gives you the probability of it belo to belong to uh, one or more topics. So you can say, okay, for instance, the first application has a description that is roughly 80% about topic one and 20% about topic two, and so on. So this is the, the first step of the, the, of the technique. We somehow um, build uh, the topic model and then we assign each um, description to a set of probabilities of belonging to these, uh, to these topics. Um, <clears throat> so for instance, the, uh, the, the London restaurants uh, uh, happen to be assigned to uh, these three topics, 
with uh, different probabilities. What we did then was to uh, cluster uh, applications based on uh, their uh, probability of belonging to, to these topics. So uh, for each application, we used um, the, the, the probability of belonging to topics as features. And then we, we, gave, this, we gave this as an input to, uh, to a clustering algorithm. We used uh, k-means to do that. And that's, uh, in this example, that's roughly how, uh, what we could get as a solution. So uh, these four applications would be clustered uh, as follows, just because in this case, uh, the two applications have a high probability of belonging to topic two and a pretty low probability of belonging to um, topic uh, one, and vice versa in, in the other case. Okay, so this is the first step and of, of, the, of the technique. So at the end of this phase, what we have is clusters of applications that have similar descriptions. So somehow all the applications that talk about navigation would end up in the same cluster. Uh, applications that talk about social uh, things, social networks, would end up in another cluster, and so on. Um, what do we do then is to analyze each single cluster in isolation, and we start looking at the, the implementation. Uh, so we look at what applications do. And to do that, uh, we started by doing some very simple uh, static analysis. And uh, more precisely, we uh, simply parsed the, uh, the Dalvik uh, bytecode from the, the Android applications, and we extracted the method invocations to, uh, to a, a limited set of uh, Android um, API invocations. And to do that, we simply focused on those API calls um, that are governed by uh, permissions. So we uh, extract information such as if the, if the application is accessing the location or if it, it's making uh, phone calls or for if it's uh, sending uh, text messages uh, or accessing the internet and so on. So each application then uh, is assigned to uh, one or more of these features. And we represent uh, these as just uh, binary features. So we have the information of whether, uh, an un uh, whether an application is using the location or not, for instance. Then what, what happens then is in the cluster, we somehow have an idea of what is the common behavior. So if we see that, uh, for instance, in this cluster, um, all applications access the the user information and uh, send SM, um, text messages. Um, but for instance, uh, only two of them um, can make phone calls. Okay, so somehow we, we have a notion of what is the, the typical behavior of this cluster of applications. Just to give you uh, an idea of two clusters, here I, uh, I'm just presenting you a, a world cloud uh, that uh, of, of a cluster that we call the travel cluster, where on top you see the most uh, representative uh, words uh, that could be found in the description of the applications in, in that cluster. And as you see, there are keywords such as map, location, search, uh, route, track, and so on. Um, and then on the lower part, there are the common, uh, the most common permissions uh, that applications in that cluster uh, uh, were using. And as you see, uh, one of the most common um, um, permission is the uh, access the location of the user, which totally makes sense because for an application that um, that is about traveling and especially talks about location. Uh, then it's, it's an information that is needed. Um, <clears throat> on the other side, uh, this is another example of, uh, an example of another cluster. What we have here is the, what we call the personalized uh, cluster, where the, the main thing, thing is about personalizing um, uh, applications. So clearly one of the key uh, terms here was uh, theme, or uh, I remember somewhere icon, or wallpaper, 
uh, and or uh, launcher and so on. And as you can see, the behavior of this uh, of these applications is uh, quite different. Um, so there is not um, much about accessing the location anymore. Uh, what is uh, more visible instead is the possibility of writing to an external uh, uh, to the external uh, SD card or the permission of changing the component okay so this is something that clearly matches the, the description okay so at this point each cluster has somehow an, a notion of what is the the typical behavior and uh, what we do then is we do uh, si simply uh, anomaly detection. So if we know that in a cluster uh, it is common to access the location or to, uh, to access the internet, then if we see that um, an application, in this case London restaurants, also accesses the, the, the account information, then we flag this as an anomaly. How do we do this in practice? We, uh, we use uh, K nearest neighbor to do that, and we simply use the uh, API calls as binary features uh, for uh, for that. Okay, so pretty pretty standard uh, techniques. So looking into the um, into the um, into the data uh, into the, the results uh, of the uh, of the anomalies, um, uh, let's see what what are some of these anomalies. So <clears throat> the most common uh, reason for applications to be anomalies were the use of advertisement libraries. So uh, back to when uh, we, we did this work, um, these two were libraries that were very, very common and were also very invasive. Uh, so most of the applications that were using these libraries uh, were doing things <coughs> that were quite um, aggressive, let's say, uh, with, uh, in, in, with, uh, with the user, because they, they used to collect quite a lot of sensitive information. Uh, so we, uh, we could detect uh, most of these um, as, as anomalies. Uh, <clears throat> we also had some cases of applications that had some, indeed, some dubious uh, behavior. So um, for instance, one, one of the things uh, that I that I re remember is that back then the Yahoo uh, email um, application could send uh, SMSs. Um, I, I looked into the code of that and I couldn't couldn't really understand why this was the case, but it was something that it could it could do, and the description was not really explaining why this uh, this thing was needed. Uh, <clears throat> We also had some, some cases that were uh, false positives, and these were uh, due to um, some behaviors that were totally fine, but were uh, somehow uncommon. Um, this was the case, for instance, of the SoundCloud that, um, um, that appeared in the, uh, in the sharing uh, cluster, but somehow since it was able to record audio, uh, this feature was not so common in that cluster. This was reported as an anomaly. But the reason was that this, this behavior was simply not, not common. Uh, a more funny case instead is uh, when uh, we had a cluster of applications that were basically all uh, uh, malicious apps, or let's say that they were all uh, uh, spyware, to, to use a, a more appropriate term, um, and they were all um, uh, poker games, and there was only one up. And, and all these applications were uh, collecting quite a lot of uh, sensitive information from the users. There was only one application that was not doing it, and it, our technique reported it as an anomaly. <laughs> so that's kind of a side effect of of doing this. So another thing that we did um, was to understand whether uh, we could uh, detect malware. So to do that, we, um, we took a set of uh, known uh, malicious uh, Android applications, and, uh, and we simply wanted to, to see whether uh, our technique <laughs> could detect these as uh, malicious. 
so the, the results uh, that we had uh, were, well, we, we thought very good back then. Um, but um, if I look at these uh, numbers right now, I, I feel like, wow, the results were actually not that great. So I, I wonder how the paper got, even got up, accepted. Uh, but to, uh, to be honest, the, the, the really nice thing about this is that we were learning, so we, uh, we learned um, the model just from the, the benign applications. So we didn't do any training on the malware. Um, so somehow the fact that we could detect uh, a good number of malicious applications as such, just because they were different, uh, was was a good uh, good result back then. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so this is uh, the these are the two numbers uh, that are important. So we could detect 56% of malicious applications as such, and uh, we uh, we had 84% of benign applications uh, identified as such. One thing that we we've been uh, wondering was um, do we really need to do the, uh, the natural language uh, part, that is the, the clustering? Um, can't we simply use the, uh, uh, well, can't we simply use the features, uh, that is the, uh, how the different applications use the different APIs uh, directly? And we tried to do that and we, we got very, very bad uh, results with that. Another thing that we, uh, we tried was, uh, why don't we simply use the categories that are on the Google Play uh, as clusters? So why do we need to, uh, to do this complicated things of topic modeling and so on? And uh, we tried to do that, and again, we got uh, worse results. So somehow, uh, we showed that that was uh, the, the best way we could get to um, um, well, to uh, to solve this problem. Um, after that, we significantly pr improved the, the results by doing uh, two, um, well, mainly one um, simple trick. That was instead of using uh, the features uh, of um, how what are the um, API calls that are the the, the, the API that are used within an application as binary features, we, we were giving different weights um, to these features. And to do that, uh, we used a simple metric that is uh, the term frequency um, uh, inverse document frequency. Basically, we, we, were, we gave more importance to uh, those API calls that were not so common in, in a cluster. And this, uh, we, we did that because we realized that uh, some, some API calls, um, mainly the ones that are related to internet, are so common that somehow are really not, not interesting and not uh, representative. So with this uh, little trick, we could get really much, much better uh, results on the, the same uh, data set. Um, <clears throat> uh, what we did after it was to think, okay, we, we've been doing this very simple static analysis um, on the Android applications. Maybe we can do something better uh, from that, that respect. Uh, so what about looking at uh, not just of how, um, not just looking at uh, if an application is using a specific uh, information. So just looking at if an application is accessing the uh, the contact list, but look at how the contact list uh, information is actually used. So for instance, if the contact list uh, is sent out to the internet. So in other words, to look at the information flows. Um, so just to give you a, a small example. Information flows means that uh, given a set of um, sources that represent some sensitive informations for the, um, uh, for the Android um, context, for instance here, 
we might have the, the, the device ID as a sensitive information, uh, we look at what are the data flows within the program that uh, uh, might lead um, from the source to, to, uh, to a point that is called a sync. That is where that information might be sent out. Uh, and so the fact of sending an SMS with uh, some sensitive information is, um, is an example of, of this. Um, I won't really go into much into the details of this, but <clears throat> so what we, what we saw is that information flows could be a really good uh, feature to uh, differentiate malware from, um, from benign applications. And here, just to give you the intuition, is how in our data set, benign applications were using uh, device ID um, so how the, the device ID flows into different uh, sinks. Uh, and here we have the benign applications on one side and the malicious ones uh, on the other side. So we see that most of the times this information is simply logged, um, <clears throat> while for the benign application, the device ID is simply used to trigger an intent, uh, while in the malicious apps, not surprisingly, uh, this application is often uh, leaked, either through a uh, network or uh, via SMS. So it was obvious then that we could simply use uh, these as features uh, for, uh, for our model. So we could do exactly the same things as we did before in the first part, but what we could do uh, instead of simply using API calls as um, binary features, uh, we could use information flows uh, to train the, uh, uh, the model for anomaly detection. <clears throat> and again, I don't really want to go into details. We can discuss more uh, about this later if you want. Uh, <clears throat> but what we did was to uh, look separately at each uh, source of information, and we could see how uh, each application was using that type of information. Um, and, and then we, we did uh, anomaly detection on, on each source separately, and then we used this information as, as a single feature uh, to train our model. Once again, we did this uh, just on, so we, we trained the model just on, on the benign applications, and then we used the model um, to, uh, to detect uh, whether, uh, to see as a, so for, for classification, so to see whether um, new applications that we haven't seen before were classified as malware or not. So um, again, on the same data set, we went from the very first results that we had in the first paper to the better results uh, with using TFIDF to the uh, much better um, um, accuracy by simply using better features in the code. Now, um, let me move on to uh, a new topic that actually is, in my opinion, more interesting, mainly because this is kind of still ongoing work. So all the, all the previous things uh, that, I, that I've been talking about are um, published work. So yes, it could be interesting to discuss about this, but um, I'm actually more um, yeah, curious to, to hear from you on, 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 this, um, on the, this ongoing work. So, um, and, and the, the new direction is not just to, to look at the description or the code, but to look at um, something, something else in an Android application that is the user uh, interface. Yeah, so as I just said, uh, in the previous works, uh, we just focused on, on these two artifacts. The, the description and the code, and we tried to figure out whether the two things uh, were matching. But there is another, uh, another thing that is uh, also interesting and could be analyzed, and it's the, the user interface of an application. More, uh, most importantly, if we 
look at these two elements, so the description and the user interface, and we try to compare the two, what we might identify is that, that there are some hidden functionalities. So some things that are in the application but are not properly described in the, in the description. So somehow what we might identify is problems uh, in the description. So identify when, uh, when an application is poorly uh, described. If we look instead at the other side, if we compare the user interface to uh, the code, uh, what we might identify is something that is somehow on the same level, uh, so some hidden behavior that could either represent some, uh, we think, poor usability. So think about something that, um, so if you see something, if an interface tells you something, but then it ends up doing something that is completely different, then it's probably not so intuitive for the user um, to use it. Or you could also identify potentially some stealthy behavior. So uh, if an application is doing something uh, underlying without clearly uh, showing this on the user interface, then this might be something relevant to look into. So let's start from the, uh, the, first, the first part, so to look at um, description versus um, user interface. So the idea is, is simple. We, here we simply look at the natural language uh, information that we find on the two different artifacts. And let's say here um, I'm bringing the example of the, the Twitter application. If we look at the description, then it talks about um, being able to connect with people, uh, send private messages, and blah, blah. If you look at the, uh, uh, an extract of the user interface, here it says, well, there is uh, a, um, a button on the, on the menu on top that says uh, messages, and that is something that indeed is mentioned. Uh, it talks about finding friends, and somehow it's related to connecting to people, or talk privately with anyone, and again, it connects to, uh, to the same thing. So in this case, somehow there is a match between what is described in the, in the description that you find in the Google Play and what the, the user interface looks like. However, I think you don't know, well, at least I didn't know, that until not long time ago, Twitter allowed to have purchases within, uh, within the application. Um, and that's, so in some of the tweets, uh, there was a link uh, that allowed you to, uh, to purchase some, some items. And you could get to screens such as the following, okay? This is something that was, again, to me was completely unknown, and it's completely uh, uh, absent in the description. <clears throat> so somehow this is an example of things, of a, a, an, an example of something that does not match, and probably is worth looking into, because somehow this type of functionality should be mentioned in the description. So let's, uh, let's see what is, uh, what is the technique that, that we developed um, to, to find this, this kind of uh, mismatch. So we start, as in the previous works, uh, we start by uh, crawling a large number of, of applications. We do some uh, pre-processing on, uh, uh, on the description of the application. And then uh, with uh, LDA as a topic modeling technique, we build a topic model, just exactly as, uh, as I told you before. And for each application, we end up with the probability of the, of the application to belong to different topics. So for instance, Twitter uh, is mainly about news and about, uh, what is that? I guess social, uh, then messaging, and so on. What we do then is 
we take the API, uh, the, the APK, sorry, the application, but this time we just extract the information from the user uh, interface. So we just extract the text that, that is visible um, on the UI. Again, we do, we do some, some cleaning. We use exactly the, the same topic model that we inferred from, from the other process. And we simply infer the, the topics um, uh, for the, the UI. And again, we end up with uh, a, probability, a set of probabilities of the UI uh, text to belong to different topics. So what we, had, what we have at the end of this is for the same application, we have two, um, two distributions of, <clears throat> uh, of, the, of the application. Um, uh, so the, the probability of the application to belong to, uh, to a specific topic based on either the, the description or the UI. What do we do at this point? We report um, when there is uh, some, some significant difference. So if there is, um, if, if the probability differs more than uh, 0 0.2, if I remember correctly, we used, then we report this. We report, though, only um, the cases when uh, there is a high probability uh, of belonging to a topic in the, um, in the UI, and there is a lower probability uh, in the description, because this identifies the case when something is uh, described, so something uh, can be inferred by looking at the UI, but is not uh, described. While, for instance, this case where the description talks about something, but the same topic cannot be found in the UI is something that we think is less, um, less important to report. So <clears throat> this, is, this is the example of, uh, of the, the two uh, um, uh, topic models of, of Twitter. So on the left, it's the one related to the description, and on the right, the one related to uh, the UI. And, and here we report the probability of, of belonging to, to the different topics. And as you see, there is, on this side, uh, the uh, probability of belonging to the purchase uh, topic that is not uh, present at all on the other side. So it is something that we think is, is relevant, and, and that's why uh, we, we report this. So in the end, uh, Twitter is, uh, appears an anomaly for two uh, topics. The first one is purchases, and the, the second one is uh, account. <clears throat> so Twitter was, uh, so this is really, we have just few initial um, results, so we don't really have a large uh, study on this, and uh, I just want to re report you another uh, example uh, that, that we found uh, with this work. And uh, it's another uh, example of an application that has uh, in the UI clearly has some um, um, uh, some features that it, that is about subscriptions. So some service that you need to pay um, in order to to have something. In this case, it's uh, uh, movies and videos uh, in streaming. And in the description, this uh, functionality. So this the somehow the information that you need to subscribe to a service is completely missing. So somehow. Uh, I think this technique could be used in order to improve the description uh, of the application so that the user really knows uh, more about what is going on. There are some, some issues, though. Uh, uh, what is the, the main problem? Well, what happens quite often is that the description of the application is really not informative at all. Um, Sometimes it's because the description is just badly written, but in other cases, such as the following, it's because there is some, somehow some common knowledge uh, of what the application is, is doing. Uh, so somehow um, things are, are given for granted. 
this is the example of, uh, of the description that appears on the Google Play for Snapchat. Uh, so Snapchat is, is an application that allows you to, to send um, um, instant message, messages uh, that disappear after a short time. But if you look at the description, well, it's, uh, it's completely non-informative. Just because here they assume that users uh, knows, uh, know already about uh, Snapchat. So uh, let's say when we are, when we are in the presence of this kind of descriptions, then there is really little uh, that we can do. Um, <clears throat> so having instead a quick look at uh, the, other, the other side, that is how to use the UI um, with and compare it to, to the code, um, possibly to detect usability issues or some uh, hidden stealthy behavior. Um, so here is uh, at least one motivating example that I can give you. Uh, so why it would be worth to, to go in this direction. This is um, TripWolf. Uh, there is a real Android uh, application that is, um, that is actually very popular on, on, uh, on the Google Play market. And uh, so this is uh, just a, a travel application. Uh, what, what we can do is um, we can try to understand what are the functionalities that can be triggered uh, starting from some <coughs> UI uh, elements. So for instance, by pressing the, the Facebook button, you, uh, you end up uh, starting a new activity uh, by pressing the, the Google uh, Plus button. Again, you start a new activity and then you access some, some shared preferences. You access uh, some information about the phone. Again, it's, it's about getting information on the contact. But one thing that appears is uh, kind of interesting is that by pressing the join, uh, TripWolf, so by subscribing to, to this service, uh, not only you start a new activity, a new, a new window of the application, but um, what happens is that the application is also accessing the location and sending it uh, out to an external uh, server. Uh, so somehow we can think, um, think of it as all all the, the, the previously mentioned um, functionalities are somehow expected to be triggered by those uh, UI elements, uh, but somehow uh, by pressing the join uh, uh, button, you don't really expect to, uh, to have your, your location to be uh, leaked out. Um, so the idea is try, again, in the same fashion of what we've seen before, Try to understand what is the common um, what is the common behavior of specific uh, UI uh, elements. So in this case, maybe I'm, I'm thinking about buttons, uh, and try to understand what um, uh, labels um, in in buttons can lead you to in terms of functionalities that would be triggered in the code. And by by learning uh, this information from the majority of applications we could uh, try to report uh, the anomalies. So uh, somehow the idea is if we, uh, if we start by analyzing all the UI elements in the application, and especially if we, if we get the text that is shown uh, on the application, and we uh, uh, get the information of what is the, the callback associated to that UI element. And uh, for, um, um, for uh, icons, uh, we get the, the alternative code. Um, then what we can do is, uh, well, actually, I think this should have been gone, sorry. Uh, <clears throat> so what we can do is um, we can, uh, Learn, we can somehow group together UI elements that have related text and learn what is 
what are the um, the API calls that might be invoked from from those, and then report some anomalies. So somehow the 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 picture is if we can group together UI elements that somehow represent the sign up um, functionality, and here we would put together all the labels such as login uh, or sign up and, and similar uh, labels, then we could see that what happens most of the times is that a new uh, window is opened, but hopefully what we see is that um, the uh, accessing the, the user location is something that is an anomaly and that's something that we can uh, report. So to, to keep it, well, uh, to keep it short, uh, we can do exactly the same thing as we did before uh, with, uh, with the information flows. So again, for each button, we would, uh, we have, we would have a set of features associated uh, that are uh, what are the API calls that can be um, triggered by pressing that button. And uh, we can use this information again to train um, the, the usual um, uh, model uh, and, and report anomalies. Again, following exactly the same, uh, the same process as before. So why am I saying that this is uh, still work in progress? So we have the infrastructure to extract all the information, like the uh, UI elements, uh, to run the static analysis and, and so on. Um, but somehow we, we are not really happy with, with the evaluation yet. So what we have tried to do um, to evaluate um, this technique, that is, if you, if you assign one, uh, one label that is somehow unexpected uh, and triggers some, uh, some um, uh, behavior that is not really matching what is uh, described in the label, <clears throat> so what, what we did to evaluate this was uh, to take um, a real, uh, real uh, applications, real UI elements in the apps, and we tried to replace the labels with something uh, that, was, that was different. For instance, replace guides with uh, something that says open or print. Uh, or... Uh, or we tried to, to simply swap uh, two labels within the same activity. And by doing this, uh, we knew that these were somehow things that should have been identified by our technique, and uh, that, that was something that we, uh, at least we can measure clearly. Um, so by, by doing this on 10,000 uh, 10, um, uh, uh, UI elements, uh, we get, so by, by mutating the, the labels, we get a precision of, uh, sorry, an accuracy of 73%. Uh, uh, by instead doing the crossover, we get uh, a lower uh, accuracy. Um, and this is it actually for, for this work, as I said, uh, it's still ongoing uh, work. I'm, I'll be happy to, to, to discuss further, especially if you have some suggestions on how to do this better. Mainly, what, what are the, um, the pot potentially, what are the, uh, the well, how we can potentially use uh, our, our technique, um, to, and especially how um, to identify what. So we think that usability could be some some potential uh, interest, uh, interesting direction, um, but we are not really sure uh, about this yet. So to conclude, this this is a a, sum, um, a slide that summarizes pretty much what I presented you in the talk. So somehow the idea is so I, I presented different works, but somehow the underlying idea of all these uh, techniques is just one that is we take. Uh, a large number of applications, and we somehow learn uh, what is the common behavior, and we report um, re report uh, anomalies, uh, which can be either in the code, or it can be either in the description or in the UI element.
And that's all I have. Um, I'm happy to take question now or dis uh, discuss further. We have time for a quick question or two before people have, have to leave. Uh, so you mentioned things like advertising libraries that perform behaviors that are like kind of disjoint from the application. So like, what kind of strategies did you have to, um, like did, did you separate that from the application's behavior? Like did you mark an application that just has an advertising library as malicious just because it has that? Um, so, uh, no, we did not. So when we uh, ran the analysis, we considered the, all the code in the application as a whole, so including the library. Um, the information about the library uh, came after when uh, I manually looked into some of the anomalies and I saw that most of the, um, the, the malicious behavior uh, was coming from, from there. So there is one critical thing about trying to differentiate so trying to remove the library code from, from the rest of the application. And it is that uh, in Android, everything gets packaged together. And so if you want to get rid of uh, libraries, um, then one easy way to do this is by looking at the package name. Uh, but then if you work on uh, applications that uh, are obfuscated, then looking at the package name is something that doesn't really work. So that's why, so I, th I think there are techniques to, um, to do this, but they're not straightforward. That's why we, we simply went for the easy solution to, to just analyze everything as a whole. Yep. So I love this idea of analyzing application UIs. That's not something that's done very often. One thing I notice is that UIs have usually a pretty complicated structure. There's, for example, there's often user-generated bits like in Twitter, uh, right? Tweets are just written by who knows whom. Uh, and there are also bits that are application controls, some application content, and so on. Did you uh, do anything to try to separate those pieces, say, have your uh, user content not be part of the application context or something like that? Right, one thing that I forgot to mention is that we do everything statically. So for instance, the user information of the Twitter mm -hmm. is, is not there. Mm -hmm. That would definitely be a problem if we wanted at some point to, to do this dynamically. Then it would definitely be a challenge. Did you find any cases where, and I know on Android maybe this isn't too common, where applications did some really interesting UI stuff dynamically that you couldn't catch? Uh, yes, um, actually what, what we had to deal with uh, is um, when, um, when callbacks or some labels are dynamically um, uh, bound to, uh, to some, some, some UI elements at runtime. So that's why we, just analyzing the XML file that represents the, the view of of an activity is not enough. You also have to do some, some analysis on the code to catch those cases. But then another challenge is uh, to work with uh, web views uh, that are very common. And right. those are things that, yeah, we, we haven't dealt with yet. And it's, it's really not trivial. OK, <clears throat> so why don't we wrap up? But Alessandra is around if people want to go up and uh, ask more questions afterward. I'm sure she'd be delighted to talk to you. Thanks for the good questions, and thanks again, Alessandra. Thank you.